Hey, coming to uh, study Sabbath school together. I want to also welcome those who are tuning in on either television or some are watching satellite television or uh, land-based television, free-to-air television, and many are watching on the internet. And we have some of you who are actually digital or online members of Granite Bay. We want to give you a special welcome. For those who are watching, wondering what do I mean by that, there are folks around the world that do not have a local church they can attend. And so we sort of adopt them and try and stay connected, give them some kind of contact with a church family. If you'd like to know more about what it means to be one of our online members, just go to granitebaysda.org and we'll be happy to uh, shepherd you through that process. We're continuing, as Pastor Sean mentioned, our study on families and our lesson today is lesson number 12 and it's talking about what have they seen in your house? And that title is based on a scripture we're going to look at in just a moment. What have they seen in your house? We have a memory verse which is 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Now sometimes I share my testimony and when you share a testimony it's not like a sermon where you have a lot of scripture but the one scripture I read before I do my testimony is this verse. Why don't you say it with me? Here it's in the New King James Version. You ready? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God wants us to live lives that are proclaiming praises. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, but he said, you are the light of the world. Individually, you're all little lighthouses. We're supposed to let his light shine out of us. It's just like the sun has, or the moon has no light of its own except as it reflects the light of the sun. The church is to be a light in the world. You know, we're in the final stages of building a church yeah, that is going to be a, a training center, an evangelistic training center. I've been working on this for, believe it or not, 20 years from conception <laughs> to delivery, which we trust is this year. And we want that, it's up on a hill, it's a really nice view, but we want it to be literally a light on the hill from media. But not only is the church in the community to be a light on the hill, families are to be a light on the hill. You are to be lights in your community through your families. And that's the theme we're talking about what did they see in your house. Now, uh, I may as well get right into what the lesson is dealing with. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 38. We need to do a little reading here and get this story. And it'll basically set the stage for all that we're going to be studying today. Isaiah chapter 38. This is one of the, you know, in the New Testament, you'll find the same story three times because it's in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, they call it the harmonic or synoptic gospels. Very rarely in the Old Testament you find a story mentioned three times. The story we're going to look at now may be the only one I can think of that you find mentioned three times. It's in Isaiah. We're going to read it in Isaiah. It's in Chronicles and it's in Kings. So it really stood out in Old Testament history. First go to Isaiah 38 verse 1. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you will die and not live. Now setting your house in order, you know what that means. He said, make sure that you've got your, your will and your estate plan and how you want your um, uh, affairs to be taken care of after you're gone, get things set in order. Some of you remember that Ahithophel, he went and set his house in order and then hung himself. He knew he was about to die. So he, he uh, freshened up his will and his estate plan and then he hung himself. So when Isaiah says to Hezekiah, set your house in order, he says, do you have your, your will and your estate plan all taken care of because you're going to die. Now how many of you would like to get that news? Uh, that's terrible to get one of those doctor reports that says that uh, your days are numbered. Of course, if you didn't know it, all of us, our days are numbered. I don't know, I don't want to shake you up, but you know life is terminal. This life, <laughs> until, until you are born again, uh, then you just go to sleep when you die. So Hezekiah is not very happy about that. It's natural for us to try to live as long as we can, even in this life. So he turned his face toward the wall and he prayed. And he said, remember now, O Lord, 
I pray how I've walked before you. Hezekiah was a good king with a loyal heart and I've done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly and it just moved the heart of God. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, go tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord. Matter of fact, it says the word of the Lord came to Hezekiah before he got all the way out of the uh, palace complex. Go tell uh, Hezekiah, the Lord God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will add to your days 15 years. Now in English it rhymes. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you that the Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I'll bring the shadow of the sundial which has gone down with the sun on the sundial of Ahaz 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. This is the writing of Hezekiah the king of Judah which he had been sick and then it goes through a prayer of Hezekiah. So this incredible experience, Hezekiah is told he's got a terminal disease. We later learned that he had some kind of a boil that was causing a fever and an infection and he was going to die from some septic problem and because later not only does God say I'm going to heal you, he then applies a natural remedy and he tells the, the court physicians to put a poultice of figs on the boil and you will recover. Some of you remember this, you can read this like I said in um, First Kings also. And he gets better. But he says, I'm going to give you a sign. And he asks Hezekiah, do you want the sun to go down 10 degrees or do you want it to go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah was sick, but he was still sharp enough to know it's a small thing for the sun to go down 10 degrees. It does that all the time. But if it were to go backwards, people would spot it. If it were to jump ahead 10 degrees, they'd think they just missed something. But if it went backwards and they could measure that on a sundial, and so something happened because of the prayer of Isaiah and Hezekiah that had never happened before or happened since. In the days of Joshua, Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. But now what's happening is the sun's not just standing still, it's going backwards. Now you can go ahead and blow a gasket, try to figure out how God did this astronomically. I mean, did the earth stop spinning? How come everyone didn't fly off? Did the sun stop Moving or, or, you know, so people try to figure out, how did God do this? I'm not going to worry myself. I'll ask the Lord that question. It's a conundrum. It's an enigma. Uh, we'll ask Him when we get to heaven. I just don't doubt. Maybe God just created the illusion for everyone on the planet, but He did it however He wanted to do it. So, sun, world stopped, time stopped, it went backwards. Now people that made it their business to study the heavens in Mesopotamia the wise men. Now these are not astrologers, they are astronomers. It's very different. And um, they noticed this. They were of the same order of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel was part of the Magi. He was the chief of the wise men. So there were still people there in Mesopotamia. They made it their business to study the heavens. And um, when they noticed what happened, now you've got to jump to chapter 39. I'll go to Isaiah chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan, this is one of the ancestors of Nebuchadnezzar who had not been born yet. Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, he sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and recovered. Now, why did he do that? Just because he's sending the get well card? No. They realized that, you know, when they saw the sun go backwards, they said, what has caused this phenomenon? And, and word had trickled through the kingdoms that it was the God of Hezekiah, Jehovah, the God of Israel that had done this wonder. And they thought, wow, I'd like to know more about a God like this. So here, the king of Babylon, who's wanting to find out more about this marvel, what a great witnessing opportunity. He wants to find out more about this. He sends a gift. He tries, you know, that says gift paves way for a king. He's got these emissaries that come. They say, tell us, how did your God do this? Our wise men want to know. Our people want to know. Our priests want to know. What a great opportunity. But um, instead of Hezekiah saying, let me tell you about my God, he thought, wow, wise men from Babylon. Babylon, that's where the center of learning, that's where all the math experts are and the, the astrologers are and you want to know something from me. And he was so 
impressed that they would come from Babylon, that he wanted to impress them back with his greatness. And instead of telling them about God, he blew this grand opportunity. It says, Hezekiah was pleased with them. That means impressed. And he showed them the house of his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house there's where you get the lesson. Or in his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. You notice the one thing it doesn't mention is God's house. He shows them his house, his treasury. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah. I'm in Isaiah 39, verse 3. And he said to them, what did these men say? Where did they come to you from? Hezekiah said, they came to me from a far country from Babylon. Now, far country in the Bible often means a symbol for the lost. The Gibeonites said, we have come from a far country. The prodigal son went to a far country. These people were separated from God, and he had a chance to witness. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, he still is clueless about what Isaiah is saying. He said, wow, yeah, yeah, he's still just glowing with the, hey, they came to me from Babylon. What did they see in your house? He said, I've shown them all that's in my house. There's nothing among all my treasures I have not shown them. And Isaiah said, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house that your fathers have accumulated until this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. They'll take away some of your sons who will descend from you. Their names were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Actually, names are Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Did that prophecy come true? So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word the Lord has spoken is good. For he said in his heart, at least there'll be peace in my day. It's going to happen later on. It's like he, he didn't care about what was going to happen to his posterity. It's kind of like that motor home, that big old motor home you see going down the road, that RV. And it's got the bicycles on the back and the satellite dish on the front and it's towing a jeep. It's got a bumper sticker. It says, I'm spending my children's inheritance. Seen that? So Hezekiah says, I don't care what happens to the grandkids. At least there's peace in my day. So this is uh, a very important lesson because here he had this great opportunity to, they come to him to find out about his God and instead he didn't show God. He tried to show his glory instead of God's glory. You know, I heard that um, one of the great tragedies of history. You know, the, the Protestant church is growing the fastest in Catholic countries. Did you know that? Places like Mexico, the Philippines, South America right now. Um, Catholicism is declining. The uh, evangelical churches and our church as well are exploding. You know how much the, the places we're really struggling are places like um, Middle East and China. Do you know that when Marco Polo went to China with his uncle Niccolo and his father Matteo Polo, um, the Kublai Khan was impressed with the Christian religion. Marco Polo was, became uh, very good at learning languages and he spoke fluent Mandarin or whatever it was the Kublai Khan spoke. I don't know if it was some form of Cantonese, but he learned the language. And um, he told about the Christian God and the Kublai Khan said, when you go back and you're conducting your trade, next time you go back to your country, to Venice, it says, you tell your chief priest, the Pope, send a hundred of his priests to my country to teach our people about your God. So when the Polos went back to Italy, they tried to get an audience with the Pope and says, we've just come from this incredibly large empire, much bigger than Europe, of China. They got a wall 1,500 miles around. And they have asked for us to send a hundred priests. Well, that was at the moment when there were two popes warring with each other about who was the real pope. You know, there were a couple of times in Catholic history the popes were warring. They had two popes that said, no, I'm the pope. And the other one said, I'm the pope. And they were fighting with each other. And they kept saying, he said, we don't have time for that. And they said, no, you've got, this is the greatest missionary opportunity in history. Send a hundred priests to teach them the whole nation. There's millions of people. They will convert. And they didn't do it because they were too preoccupied. Finally, at the pleading of the polos, they sent two priests. 
One got sick and died along the way, the other one turned back. And historians say history would have been so different if they had taken this seriously. Have we sometimes missed missionary opportunities because of what people see in our house? You know, um, you don't hear much about hospitality these days. I have a friend, he wrote a book on Christians and hospitality, and I was convicted when I read it. I thought, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that after church I go home and I want to crawl in my cave. And, uh, uh, but the day was when people had a lot more hospitality. Christians would bring people to their houses every week. Uh, I remember in our churches we always had um, who were the elders that took the visitors home. When you're in a bigger church it's a little harder for one family to say I'm going to take these 20 visitors home. But um, that's why we have a, some kind of a visitor's potluck every week and the elders come here. And, but uh, people used to bring everyone to their homes. Uh, things have changed. Uh, some of you, you've heard of Tom Bodette. You know, Tom Bodet was famous before he did the Motel 6 commercial. He was a speaker, a regular speaker on NPR radio. And Motel 6 hired him to do a commercial for their motel. And this was many years ago, what is it, 1986. And so they hired these very expensive marketing executives to write a radio script that was supposed to be an exact amount of time. And then they gave it to Tom to read the script about Motel 6, come to Motel 6. Well. Tom was something of an expert on the radio because he did radio broadcasts with NPR every week and he realized as he was getting to the end of the script he was stopping three seconds short. Three seconds is an eternity in radio. And he thought, I gotta put something else in there. And so totally he ad-libbed, we'll leave the light on for you. That wasn't in the script. That became the most important advertising campaign, one of the most successful advertising campaigns ever and it wasn't even invented by the marketing experts. That whole idea that you, our home is your home. You know, it's like the farmer coming in from the fields. Honey, I'll leave the light on for you. Or kids coming home late, I'll leave the light on for you. It gave that feeling of welcome. And he just ad-libbed that. But it communicated that homey feel and it proved to be very successful. Well, is your light on for others to come into your home? What have they seen in your house? Um, this is a very important part of visiting. You know, I had, um, I had an experience I'm not proud of. You maybe heard me share this before, but some watching Sabbath School maybe did not hear this. Um, you know, we have a house up in the hills. I'll be taking a little trip up there later this afternoon. I haven't been there in a few weeks. And uh, been there 40 years, or have it 40 years, and, and uh, um, David and Cindy are here today. They, they built a house. They lived up there with us 30-something years ago. It's been a while. And uh, houses off the grid, gravity flow water, solar electric. Uh, even years later, we put in a little Pelton wheel to make electricity from running water. And uh, good soil, southern exposure. It's, it's, it's nice. Um, so one day... Uh, I had some gas delivered. Now, one thing I don't have, I do use firewood. We can heat our water with firewood. But we use gas for the refrigerator and for the stove. In the summer, it's too hot inside to cook with wood, so we cook with gas. So we have to have propane delivered. So one summer, the propane comes up to deliver propane, and the young man ju jumps out. And I look at him, and I realize he's a young man that I know. He used to be in my junior Sabbath school class. I used to teach him. I also knew he had not been going to church for a while. And I thought, Lord, what a providential appointment. Here I can talk to him about his soul and how he needs to come back. He's now a young man. And, and, but he made a terrible mistake. He said, Doug, I have never been up here. This is a nice place. Did you design this yourself? Oh, he let the genie out of the bottle, that genie of pride. And I said, well, matter of fact, yes, I did. And I said, you know, I have it, I designed it here so it's got the sun comes in in the winter and I got the right angle on the roof so in the, in the summertime you don't get the sun. In the winter you do and see the solar panels on the roof. Let me show you the electric room. And I started showing, I said, yeah, you know, it's gravity flow water. And I started talking all about the house. And he seemed interested for a little while. 
Uh, but sometimes I've discovered I become hypnotized by my own voice and people aren't near as interested as I think they are. Uh, you know, sometimes you think everyone wants to hear everything you're thinking and they don't necessarily. And then he looked at his watch, he said, hey, I got to go make another delivery. And he hopped in his truck and he drove away and just as I saw the dust billowing behind his truck, I heard a little voice say, what has he seen in your house? The Lord sent him to me for me to talk to him about his, his soul and just all of a sudden I realized how proud I was. I just started talking about me and my stuff and how smart I am and I've never seen him again. And I lost that opportunity. I didn't get his contact information or anything. Now here's, this leads into this next verse. Second Chronicles 32. In those days Hezekiah, this is 2 Chronicles 32 verse 24. In those days Hezekiah was sick near death and he prayed to the Lord and he spoke to him and he gave him a sign. The sun went backwards. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him for his heart was lifted up. He thought, hey, I'm so close to God. I pray and the, there's astronomical changes. I'm so close to God. He started to think a little too much of himself. His heart was lifted up, therefore the wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. That's the same story we're talking about. So in our first section here, it's talking about learning from the king's mistake. Uh, when people come to our house, we need to be interested in talking to them about them. How many of you have heard the, the phrase fort? F-O-R-T. If you'd like to know how to share your faith in your home with people you meet, just you might want to write this down, F-O-R-T. Uh, they used to call it F-O-R-D, but then that became a bad word in uh, our church. Fort. Family, occupation, testimony. Uh, no, family, occupation, religion, testimony. I can't spell either. Ask them about their family whether you go to their house or they come to your house, let them talk about them. Um, it's so easy for us to talk about ourselves when people come over. Talk, get to know them. Find out about them. Then ask about their, what do you do? You know, I, I meet people all the time and, and um, uh, just this week, uh, one of our members here, Tony and I, were playing racquetball. Matter of fact, yesterday morning, uh, and uh, Nathan was with us and uh, met a new person. And... Uh, Wanted to get to know them. So we said, so what do you do? It's a natural segue. And then they'll, they'll often say, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. And they say, what church? And you get a chance to start talking about religion almost instantly. Then finally, tell your personal testimony. So you, you can say, so what do you do? And then you say, um, uh, do you go to church somewhere? It used to be everybody went to church in America. It was just, what church? Well, now you kind of say, do you go to church? And then the last thing you say, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian also. And God's done so much for me and give your testimony. And that then creates a segue to talk about spiritual things. And this is a great program to, to follow in your family. Um, go to the next section, family first. <coughs> and someone's going to read for me Acts 1 verse 8 in just a moment. And uh, we'll get you ready for that. I'm going to read John 1 40, 42. Chapter 1 of John the Gospel. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak when he said, this is the Lamb of God, followed him. He followed Jesus. He was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So as soon as Andrew, Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus. You know, it's Andrew who brought the Greeks to Jesus. It's Andrew who brings the little boy to Jesus. Andrew never preaches a sermon that we know of, but Andrew is always trying to bring people to Christ. First person he brings is who? a family member. That's where it should start. Go ahead, read for us, please, uh, your verse. Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Notice that Jesus gave uh, concentric circles to the disciples when he told them how they were going to witness. He said, you'll be witnesses for me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and everywhere else, the end of the world. This is exactly how they did it. Holy Spirit poured out in Jerusalem. That's where they lived. That was their home. 
They started witnessing there. And then it expanded and it went on to uh, Judea. And then it went on to the half Jews, the Samaritans, and then to the ends of the world. You know, that's how it happened in Acts. Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, then the Holy Spirit in Judea, then the Holy Spirit fell in Samaria, then the disciples in chapter 8 were scattered everywhere preaching the gospel. So the very thing Jesus said what happened is how you read it unfolding in the book of Acts. But it starts at home. You want to be able to start doing evangelism. You know, sometimes in doing our AFCO training, people come to our program and they say, oh, why are you taking the training? I want to go to the foreign mission field. I want to be a missionary. I said, that's wonderful. The Lord's put that on your heart. I said, how many people have you led to the Lord at home? Well, I haven't. Yeah, it'll be much easier to go talk to them pagans out there, in the primitive countries. And so wait a second. Uh, you haven't led any of your family to the Lord? You're not leading anyone in your neighborhood or where you work to the Lord? You don't want to go overseas. Uh, first you want to start at home and see, can I lead someone here locally? If you can't reach anybody locally, why do you think it's going to be easier when you go to a foreign country? You can't speak the language. And so uh, good evangelism is going to begin right there in the home. By the way, where is it the hardest? It's in the home. Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except where? At home. The hardest people for me to reach with my family because they knew my past before I came to Christ. When I said, I found the truth, they said, oh man, you, you've tried all these different religions. This is just another one, Doug. It took a few years for them to say, oh, it looks like you're serious about this Christianity stuff. Because I had been hopping from, you know, Buddhism to yoga to meditation and just all these different things. They said, yeah, yeah, I don't. So hard to reach your family sometimes. Luke 8, 39, after Jesus saved the demoniac, he said, I want to go with you, Jesus. Jesus said, no, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And Jesus said, go to your house. What did he do? He went his way and he proclaimed through the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. But where did Jesus tell him to start? Now, Jesus blessed his efforts. He was sincere. But he said, go home. Tell those in your home. And Telling those in your home doesn't mean you go shake them by the throat and say, I, you need to believe. It means witnessing in your home. And you want to be a consistent witness. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if anyone does not provide for his own, meaning his own family, and especially those of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So here's a principle. When it comes to providing financially, the Bible says if you're not providing for your own family, speaking of a working man, you're worse than an infidel. What's more important, providing for your own family financially or spiritually? The first priority would be, well, you want to make sure they're fed, but make sure they're fed spiritually. Deuteronomy 6, after he makes that wonderful statement, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He then says, And these words that I command you today, this is the Ten Commandments you find in Deuteronomy 5, These words I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That means do you have evening worship? Last night before we went to sleep, well, when the Sabbath started in our family, we only got one of our offspring at home for the summer, Nathan, so we have family worship, have uh, Sabbath worship. Woke up this morning, we kneel together, we pray, don't have time Sabbath morning for a, a long study because everyone's kind of running hither thither, but you always take your time and you spend time with the Lord. But it's not just when you're, um, you know, having your formal worship. When you walk by the way, put the word on the doors of your house, on your gates, so that it's surrounding all you do in your family. This is, let them see it in your house. Ruth chapter 1 verse 14 because of the witness of Naomi in the home, it especially impressed her daughter-in-law. It says, Then they lifted up their voices again and wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. She said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. In other words, or, uh, Orpah, I always want to say Oprah, Orpah, um, at one time had worshipped Jehovah, but now she says she's going back to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. 
For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, there will I die, and I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. There's hardly a more poignant declaration of loyalty in the Bible. I sometimes use this when I do weddings. Um, of what Ruth said. What Ruth said to Naomi. Why did she say that? She had seen God in Naomi's heart. And she saw it was so different from the gods of the Moabites. She says, no, I'm staying with you. Your God is my God. Because she saw her live it out in the home. It wasn't because she had all the blessings. Because here she lost her husband and two sons in the time that Ruth knew her. But she saw how Naomi dealt with all that through trust in God. And she said, I'm sticking with you. And because of that, she ended up becoming a mother in Israel. Now somebody's got for me 1 Peter 2, verse, um, uh, 1 Peter 3, rather, verse 1 and 2. You got that? All right, Dan, I think we're ready for that now, so you go ahead. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. All right, thank you. Now Peter is talking here about a situation where you've got a believer married to an unbeliever. Let's hope that's because one was converted. Uh, we know there are cases where even though we've been counseled very clearly in the Word, believers should not marry unbelievers. Sometimes they still do it anyway. Um, and then they repent later. <laughs> and they say, oh, I've got to bring my spouse, wife, or husband to the Lord. And what's the best way of doing that? Being a witness by your behavior. It says conversation in the King James Version. By the, your conversation, well, it would certainly include your words, but the most important thing is your conduct. It means as they behold your godly conduct, your love. And I'll tell you, if anybody's going to know that you've got flaws and warts, it's going to be your spouse. Um, being a consistent, loving, patient Christian that does not get irritated, that does not retort and be sarcastic and to be loving and kind in the family, that is the biggest challenge. And boy, if you can do that there, it'll win their hearts. You probably heard me share this story before. It's one of the old evangelism stories about this a woman that was married to just an ornery man. Uh, she had converted to Christ after their wedding and uh, he, he ended up turning to drink and he was often coming home drunk and he'd bring his friends home and he'd wake up his wife and say, hey, you cook me something. I got some friends here. You got anything to eat? She was very rude. His friends banging around in the house making noise, waking her up and she was always so kind and so patient. Now, I'm not saying you should have to put up with that kind of abuse but she did. And one night after he had brought his friends over and she cooked them something to eat and they had been misbehaving and they all left, um, he began to cry. He realized how mean he was being to his wife. And um, she came over and she put her hand on his shoulder and he says, how come you're so good to me? He says, I am so rude and I'm so inconsiderate. I'm so unkind to you. And you are so good and patient and loving. You put up with such bad behavior. He says, why are you so good to me? And she said, honey, she said, uh, I found Jesus and I have everlasting life. She says, I'm going to have a new body and live in a world and he's prepared a mansion for me and I'm going to be happy forever. She said, the only happiness you're going to have is this life. I feel sorry for you, so I'm just trying to make you as happy as I can. <laughs> and that broke his heart, and he was converted. So it doesn't always happen that way, but uh, one of the best ways you can reach people if you're in a divided home is by your behavior, and you really need to pray for extra grace to make that happen. Amen? <clears throat> Paul says, now, what if you are married to an unbeliever? Now, when Paul writes this, keep in mind, he's talking, the, the, the gospel had taken off like wildfire among the Gentiles. The Greeks everywhere were accepting Christ. But sometimes just one member of the family, maybe just the husband or just the wife. So he's not talking about people who chose to be unequally married. He's talking about people who are pagans. One of them accepted the Lord. The spouse has not. And so this is what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. To the rest, I say, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife that does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let, her not, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. 
For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean. This is a very important theological point here, that there's a sanctifying influence of the believing parent on the children. And Paul is also saying the children are an additional reason for married people to stay married. And uh, you're setting the, an example for them there. But he goes on to say, um, but now they're holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. So this is one of the few exceptions for divorce that if, if you've got two people that are pagans, not talking about Christians, two people that are pagans, one accepts the Lord. The unbeliever says, I didn't sign up for that. I worship Mercury and Jupiter. I'm leaving. And... Um, this young woman now is abandoned and maybe she has children, is she now never allowed to remarry again? The Bible says, Paul says here, this would be a case where she would be allowed to remarry again. He says, uh, you're not under bondage in such cases. But, um, so you'd be a witness in your family to your unbelieving spouse. Look in um, Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he's Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for you, for her. So he's talking about there needs to be love. There needs to be submission in the family. And you melt the other person's heart by the behavior. All right, and then um, there's a next section that talks about family life is for sharing. And here we go to 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. By your example, you mirror Christ in the family to visitors and to the actual other members of the family. 1 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. Therefore I urge you, imitate me, and for this reason I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So, so there should be a modeling of Christ in the family. Ephesians 5.1 Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And so we want to model God's behavior in, in our family. 1 Thessalonians 1.16 And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And then there's one more here in Hebrews 6, verse 12. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. You all know what um, bonding is in animals. You have, uh, they found it in fish, they found it in birds, and they find it even in mammals. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I was playing soccer in Central Park. I actually kicked the soccer ball up against the window of the Natural Museum of Natural History. It didn't hurt it, the window because there were iron bars. But I went to get my ball and I found this cat ran out from the metal bars of the window and I looked down and I realized, oh, she had some kittens. Uh, you know, there's feral cats all over New York City. They also have feral rats too. But um, I thought, wow, I looked in and I saw these little bitty kittens. They weren't that big. And I went to pick one up and it spat at me and it, it wanted to kill me. Now it couldn't do much but I, it scared me. You ever seen that little bitty cat? It was just old enough where it knew that I was not its mother. And uh, it was wild. I uh, couldn't take it home. Then again I've been there when baby kittens are born and they're used to a human being around the mother and petting the mother and you can pick them right up and they, they figure, okay with mom, okay with me. That kind of bond, they, they become used to it. Um, with ducks, do you know if when a duck hatches, if the mama duck is not there but the family dog is there, if that dog is laying by the baby ducks, when that dog gets up, the ducks will follow the dog. How many of you have seen this? Uh, they bond. And uh, people have a little bit of that inside us. Every human being has a little photographic plate, for lack of a better word, inside our minds. And we sort of become like what we behold. We are changed by beholding. 
And so as we model Christ in our families, it's especially sensitive when they're children, but even for older people. When I first became a Christian, I had no idea how a Christian was supposed to act. But a pastor and his wife took me into their home and they modeled Christianity. I said, I don't know, how do you keep the Sabbath? What, what's Sabbath keeping look like? I saw how they did it. What does family worship look like? I saw how they did it. How are you supposed to talk to a husband and wife? I saw how they treated each other. They're just so kind. <laughs> One time he was carrying a long pile of lumber, Pastor Phillips. He was like 80-something years old. He had a long piece of lumber, and his wife was in the driveway, and he turned around, just like a vaudeville thing. He hit her in the head with a board. She said, Joe! He clobbered her. And she said, oh, I'm so sorry, dear. She said, it's okay. And they were so nice. I thought, in most families, they would be screaming and cursing at each other after something like this. But, so I saw how they modeled it, and people, even when you're older, by beholding people modeling Christianity, you become changed. So you want to do that in your family. If you've not been doing it, it's not too late to change. Amen? You get the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. Someone's going to read for me uh, Isaiah 58. It's, our family should be centers of contagious friendliness. Okay, you have that? Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bond of the wickedness? to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and to hide yourself from your own flesh? So what does he say? What is Isaiah saying is one of the most important fasts? You bring people into your homes. You bring to your home the poor who are cast out. Jesus said when you have a feast, don't invite your friends. Bring them in your home. Now that doesn't mean that you need to all go get a van and drive around the neighborhood and bring all the homeless to your home. Blessed are the poor in what? Spirit. God especially wants us to bring, bring people into our home that are, have spiritual poverty. They don't know the Lord. Study with them. 1 Peter 4.19, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. You know one reason we don't have so much hospitali hospitality today? Hotel chains everywhere. People travel, they don't stay in homes anymore. They stay in hotels. I know Bonnie's here. When the Heritage Singers first started going on the road, they stayed, you would arrange houses for them to stay in. They'd stay in people's homes. Last few years it was all hotels. Things started changing. You remember when pastors would come to a town and do a meeting? It's what family would they stay with? But now it's what hotel would they stay in? Now people communicate digitally. People used to go to homes and talk. They talk on the phone. Singing? You wanted to sing with a group? You went to a home and you'd sing. Now you just press the button on your iPod or whatever and you get the music that way. Uh, relationships used to be you interact with people. Now you turn on television and you watch other people relate. People are so absorbed now in their personal comfort and convenience, the idea that a stranger would invade our homes kind of puts us all out. But what does the Bible say about hospitality? Speaking of someone who qualifies as a bishop, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Titus uh, chapter 1 verse 7 and 8, but a bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, but hospitable, a lover of what is good. Romans 12 verse 9, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Was Lot hospitable with the angels? Ended up saving them. What about Rahab with the spies? Did Jethro take in Moses? And Moses got a wife out of the deal. And those of you who are singles, Elijah stayed with the widow and she had a baby and a resurrection. She invited him to her upper room. Jesus was invited to Peter's house and he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And um, uh, you got Zacchaeus. Jesus said, I want to abide in your house. Martha and Lazarus invited Jesus. There's a lot of hospitality in the Bible. We're just out of time. Let me remind you of what our free offer is today. Friends, if you joined us a little late and you missed this at the beginning, it's called Compromise, Conformity, and Courage. Talk to us about how to live in the last days. If you'd like a free copy, all you need to do is call 800 866-788-3966. That's 866-STUDY-MORE. 
ask for offer number 774. You can also get this, you can text and download it. Just text SH019 to 40544 and you can read that online. God bless you till we study His Word together again next week. For those